Welcome to Machon HaMikdash, the Temple Institute. Basically, we are dedicated here to every aspect of the Torah's commandments to build the Holy Temple. So, we are actually a think tank of research and activity all geared around this concept of the Holy Temple. And once upon a time there was a Holy Temple. In fact, there was a tabernacle when the children of Israel left Egypt. There was a first temple, there was a second temple. And all the prophets tell us that it's the period, the era of the third temple, which is going to be unparalleled in human history as far as it being a time of total unity and harmony amongst all the nations. And that's certainly the time that we strive for. And here basically what we're about is trying to be as involved as possible and trying to be um, as actively engaged as possible as far as research and action in this incredible concept of what the Holy Temple is all about. And I'd like to tell you more about what we're doing and show you a little bit more of the concept of the Holy Temple. Please let us go look. Okay. Thank you. You know, Shalom, when the Temple stood, what was it? It wasn't just a synagogue, it wasn't a synagogue at all, it wasn't just some magnificent building rooted in the biblical past of the Middle East. The Holy Temple was like a place above time and space. It was a meeting point between man and the divine. And the entire house of Israel, and in fact the whole world, came to the Holy Temple to engage in a direct spiritual relationship with God. And in fact, what the Torah really teaches is that the Holy Temple is the vehicle which brings about the, the rectification of the spiritual relationship between man and God. And the Temple Mount, Har Habayit, right, the mountain of the house, it's the house, it's everything, it's God's house. That is the one place on earth that God chose to rest His presence. You know that there's an expression in the, in the Bible, or forms of this expression, variations of it hundreds of times, the place that I will choose, the place that I will show you. What is that place? That's the place that from the very beginning of time, even before creation, God sanctified that one place. From there, to make His presence manifest and known throughout the whole saga of human history. And that place is the holiest place for the whole world. And it's the only holy place for Israel, the place of the Holy Temple. And we believe that despite the fact that the Temple was destroyed and the Jews went into exile and hasn't yet been rebuilt, the sanctity of that place has never waned. It's still as holy as it always was, you know. One of the most ironic things is when a tour guide will say to a group of people, you know, the Western Wall is the holiest shrine in Judaism. It's not true. The Western Wall is a very holy place. And it's been sanctified by the prayers of our people for over two millennia. But in the time of the Holy Temple, the Western Wall had no spiritual significance at all. It was merely on the outside. It was the western side of the retaining wall around the Temple Mount complex. But the holy place for Israel and for the world is what's on top, the spot of the Holy Temple. And that's the place that God wants to see us in. And we have received a, a promise from Ezra, every prophet, which was like the major mandate of, of all the prophets, that one day the Temple is going to be rebuilt. How and when, we really don't know, but we just know where and we know why. We know why because this is really a central theme of Torah faith. You know, there, there are 613 commandments that the Jewish people were commanded in. You know how many of them are dependent on the Holy Temple to, to, to be fulfilled? 202 of these commandments are totally dependent on the Holy Temple. That already shows us something about how important the Temple is. But there's no question about the fact that today, in our generation, in these past few generations, with the return of Israel to her land, and the miracles that we've seen of the ingathering of the exiles and, and the, the rejuvenation of the Jewish people with her own language and her own land, the, the whole idea of the Temple, I think, it takes on a whole new significance because to be that light to the nations and to march towards our destiny, we really have a, a job to do in the world like no one else, and that is to, to make a statement to the whole world that it's possible to live with God in our midst. That's the whole idea of the desert tabernacle, you know, the whole nation living as one man, one heartbeat, centered on the divine side of life. One of the main focal points of our work is the actual restoration of the vessels that can be used in the Holy Temple. So the things that I'd like to show you here, some of these things that we see here, they're not models or replicas or copies or museum pieces, but they're actually real and ready to be used in the rebuilt Holy Temple. 
And this is actually considered like the first stage of building the temple itself. So it's the first time that you see these things on the face of the earth for 2,000 years, and they're real. That means that they're made according to the original material. If, if the Bible requires them to be made from silver or copper or gold, um, we, we're looking here at two beautiful pieces. The shuffle that we see here on the right, made out of silver, is designed for the very first job that was done every day at dawn in the Holy Temple, which is when the Kohanim, the priests who are officiating in the temple, have to remove a, a particular amount of ashes from on top of the altar. All of the vessels that we see here are designed for various aspects of the service, and there's a tremendous amount of research involved as far as how these things look and how they're to be made. And you can imagine that um, this is really kind of shedding light on an area of Torah study which has kind of fallen by the wayside over all of these years. Here we have the copper wash basin and stand, the kiur. And every day at dawn, before commencing to do any of their sacred tasks in the Holy Temple, the kohanim, the priests, must sanctify their hands and feet from the water of the laver. This is done in a very unique fashion. At the same time, the right hand over the right foot, the left hand over the left foot. And this is called kiddush yadayim v'raglayim, sanctifying the hands and feet. And again, every one of these vessels is created with a tremendous amount of consultation and research into various different aspects of how these things were created then and how they should be done now as well. Rav Shalom, let's walk around a little bit so I can show you some more of the things that we have upstairs. Excellent. This beautiful painting uh, is the artist's rendition of the high priest offering incense in the Holy Temple. And the incense service was very, very important. I want to speak a little bit more about that. This is actually the golden incense altar. This is gold-plated cedar wood, just as if we have a description in the Torah. And you know that incense was offered every day in the inner, holier part of the temple, in the Hechal, the sanctuary, twice daily. And the incense offering, according to the mystical writings of Judaism, the Zohar, was the most beloved part of the temple service in God's eyes. Because what it really represents is the unity of the Jewish people, which is a very elusive thing. You know, every part of the temple service works on so many different levels. It's not just, you know, on one level, but it has an ethical and a moral and a mystical level also of, of what it really represents. Everything going on in the temple is really just a microcosm of the whole universe. And the incense ingredients, um, it's a tremendous subject of research because there are 11 different, different ingredients that come from various plants uh, from all over the world. And when they're compounded, according to this secret that was never written down, but was handed down orally in every generation in one particular family of the priesthood. So when the incense is compounded according to that tradition, then it makes the most beautiful aroma. So 10 of these ingredients have a very beautiful smell, but one of them is called chalbana, right? the galbanum, that has a very foul odor. But yet, when the ingredients are made in that, in that, according to that recipe, in that amount, so then together, they make the most beautiful smell. And on one level, the sages teach us that that foul-smelling ingredient is like corresponding to people who don't act so nice, you know, their deeds perhaps are not what they should be, but yet, when we are together with unity, then that is stronger than anything else. And so the togetherness and the unity of the Jewish people is really the most important thing of all. Also, in this case, we see these beautiful silver trumpets. They're made of one piece of silver. There were actually 120 trumpets that were blown every day in, in the temple. The trumpets were blown uh, on various occasions when the great gates of the temple were open and closed, and also to herald the arrival of uh, Shabbat, the Sabbath, and the new moon, and there were various occasions. So the, the trumpets are a very, very important instrument amongst the musical instruments in the temple. And over here, Shalom, we have some of the musical instruments of the Levites. You know, the Levite choir played many, many beautiful instruments as part of the service in the Holy Temple. And one of these instruments is the ten-stringed lyre. And in fact, this is the instrument which in Jewish tradition is associated with King David. You know, the Talmud tells us that King David had a lyre suspended above his bed. And at midnight, a wind came on its own and began to play on the lyre, and that woke him up. That was his alarm clock. And it was in those wee morning hours that he um, meditated and did his own contemplation with God and wrote the book of Psalms, really. So the, the lyre is really the instrument which is King David's. One of the garments worn by the high priest is a golden crown. And it's worn a 
across his forehead, not on top of his head like a king, but across his forehead, and it carries the words, holiness to God. And every moment while the high priest is officiating in the holy temple, he must bear this on his forehead. It requires a tremendous amount of concentration and intention. And it reminds him of how his thoughts have to be sanctified to God all the time. So this is a crown of one, one piece of uh, pure gold. Now, everyone is familiar with the Hanukkah story, right? You know, the, the menorah and the um, beautiful golden menorah that the Institute has created. The menorah was kindled every evening in the Holy Temple. And the story of Hanukkah, of course, uh, relates the fact that only one cruise of oil that was still pure was, was found to have survived the desecration of the enemies that came into the Holy Temple. Here we have two different sizes of golden flasks for the uh, menorah. This one on, the, on the, this side here, the small one, that's enough oil for each individual cup of the menorah. And the larger one is enough oil for one lighting of the whole menorah. So the story that of Hanukkah that, that we all hear about, what they found was they found one this size, which contained enough oil to light one time for, uh, for all the lights. This beautiful menorah is actually kosher to light in the Holy Temple. This is the, the first menorah that's been created for the Holy Temple in almost 2,000 years. And we took one base metal and treated it and plated it over with one solid piece of gold so that this menorah is not pure gold, but it actually has a, a halachic precedent. In other words, according to Jewish law, um, one can start with a menorah um, of a different metal and then plate it over. And this menorah actually is, of course, according to the biblical scheme of the flowers, cups, and knobs, just as we find in the Torah's description. It's the um, height of uh, a little bit higher than an average man. It's called 18 handbreadths. And this menorah is actually uh, ready to light in the temple. Rev Chaim, I see you've reproduced here at the Temple Institute the, the garments that were worn by the priests when they served in the temple. And if, I, if my learning serves me properly, there were two sets of garments. Four of the garments were worn by both the regular priests in their daily work and by the high priest on the special holidays like Yom Kippur. They always wore, everybody always wore a tunic, a tunic being the white garment that covered the body like a gown. Secondly, the belt. The abnet was a belt of 19 meters that was woven, putting together wool and linen, which is called shotness, and were worn around the center of the body as a belt around the waist. There was the turban that was worn upon the head, right, of both the Kohen Gadol and the Kohen Hedjo. That's the special priest and the regular priest working daily. Basically, they were linen or wool wrapped around the head. And finally, we have Miknas Ayim, which were the pants that were worn underneath the robe, right, if it's near, to cover the person to keep them uh, modest. Then when the head Kohen served on the special high holidays and did special work in the temple, he additionally wore a blue robe covering the original tunic. He had an aphod, which was like an apron, right, that tied around the back of his, of his body. We had the breastplate, right, which was contained 12 very precious and semi-precious stones, each one representing a different tribe of the 12 tribes of, of Yaakov. And during the time of prophecy, this breastplate was the item that spoke, the Kohen used to speak to the people and to prophesize. Bless you. It's a holy experience to be here.